some of them had to stay late in clinics. So I'm very grateful. Uh, but it's me bringing, uh, bringing you home to the final leg. And um, as with all of these things, uh, we could talk about calcs for uh, hours and hours, but we're not going to. We're going to talk about it for about 15 minutes, uh, assuming my presentation will move. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry. So, um, as I said, we can talk about calcs for ages, but we're not going to, about 15, 20 minutes. And I think the first thing to appreciate with the calcaneus is that it's a really funky shaped bone, right? It's completely asymmetric. Um, and I think it's important to appreciate some of the anatomical quirks to understand how we can treat the fractures and what we're trying to achieve. So hopefully you can see my cursor as well. Um, this is the standard view that we're used to seeing from the lateral side. So we've got a big tuberosity here at the back. Um, this is the posterior facet, and we'll look at that from a different angle in a second. We've got the anterior process here. And there's a couple of lumps and bumps on the lateral side, and it's important to know what they're for. One of them is the attachment for the calcaneofibular ligament, CFL. So that gives your subtalar joint a bit of um, stability. Um, and the other is a tubercle behind which your perineals can tuck behind. And that's important because it means that the perineals can be involved and are often involved in calcaneal fractures. If you have a look at the other picture, um, we're looking at the posterior tuberosity here in a sort of coronal cut. And you can see hanging out the medial side, somewhat like a car wing mirror, is your sustentaculum tali. Now, uh, it's got important ligaments that connect the tali, uh, sustentaculum tali to the talus above, so your deltoid is the main one. But importantly for calc fractures, your um, FHL tendon, so your flexor hollis longus, and your neurovascular bundle pass directly under the sustentaculum tali. And obviously they can be involved in fractures as well. When you look at things from the top, um, you see that we've got four articulating surfaces. Um, the three on the top are the, the posterior facet, which is the largest, and then you've got your anterior and middle facets, which are often confluent in one area. And then, of course, when you look at it from the bottom, you can see slightly more clearly your articulating surface with your cuboid, which is about here. Just in front of your posterior facet is the sinus tarsi region. We'll come back to it, but it's something that you'll hear the name of a fair bit. And again, you can see sustentaculum from underneath, You've got a nice groove for your FHL. So how do these injuries present? Well, they're really high energy injuries, right? So ATLS and in particular, a careful secondary survey. We're often talking about falls from height. And if you imagine you're landing on your heels and that force is transmitting through your ankles, through your tibia, through your knees, femurs, hips, and going into your back. And in fact, we know that about 10% um, of calcaneal fractures are associated with vertebral fractures. So there's a high rate of associated injury, ipsilateral, contralateral, and in the back. Assessment of soft tissues is super important, right? And it's a big area with calc fractures that the air, skin around your heel is generally pretty crappy. We've got to remember that 15% are open injuries. Um, and if you're lucky by the time you get to a calc, it have a bit of bruising, but it doesn't look too bad. If you're less lucky, you start to get the fracture blisters that are appearing and you're starting to think of trouble because that's only going to get worse. How are you going to fix this if you need to? And if you're really unlucky, it can look pretty horrific in the end. So soft tissue is really important. One thing I haven't put on the slide is that the patient factors are really important as well. You need to find out what job the patients do. Are they smokers? Are they drinkers? Do they have diabetes? Are they taking any meds that are going to compromise their healing? Things like steroids or rheumatoid. So all that stuff is really important for putting together an individualized, tailored approach for all of these injuries. Uh, OK, imaging. You need to know what x-rays you need. So we'll spend a bit of time on this. AP ankle. First of all, why do you need it? Well, like I said, you do get associated injuries with lateral. But not only that, you can actually see quite a lot of the talus um, on an AP. And basically, if I'm just drawing around the outside here, that's your posterior tuberosity end on. OK, so you can see the shape of that. You can see that that is your sustentaculum tali on the um, medial side. Um, and you can therefore you'll be able to see quite a lot of that. And just remember here that under your fibula, there's a bit of space, right? There's not a lot under here. And we'll, we'll come back to why that's relevant later. You've got your lateral x-ray, which we all are 
pretty much um, familiar with. You've got the uh, subtalar um, sub joint, um, the posterior facet here. Just peeping through, you've got the anterior and middle facets. Um, you've got your articulating surface with your uh, cuboid, and you've got your big posterior tuberosity here and your, your Achilles attaching. So that's your pretty much bog standard view that you need. Obliques are good at looking at the anterior process of the calcaneus, so looking at subtle fractures there. And the two other terms you'll hear are the Broden view and the Harris axial. So the Broden view, you massively internally rotate the foot and you just change the foot position. And it gives you a nice view along the posterior facet at the back of the subtalar joint. And really importantly, your Harris axial view gives you the opportunity to see how well aligned your posterior tuberosity is. Now, the tendency is for these to go into varus. So that's your sustentaculum there. Uh, important part we'll come back onto again. But you need to have a look at where the heel is in relation to the medial side. And you'll often find that everything's slowed in that way. Um, best imaging, of course, is a CT scan because that will give you loads of cross-sectional multiplanar images. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of angles, well, there are loads of angles that you can talk about with calc fractures, but a couple that are particularly important. Um, you need to know about Gisane's angle. Now, Gisane's angle is the angle subtended between a line along the posterior facet, okay, and a line along the anterior process of the calcaneus, okay? And that area is sort of in keeping uh, with your sinus tarsi type area. That normal angle is between 120 and 140 degrees. If you look at the right hand side of your screen, you will see that this is a calcaneal fracture. It's a bit smashed up and you can see the tendencies for these calcanei to become flat. So if we do Gisane's angle here, you can see the angle is way more, it's way higher, it's more increased, right? Because it's flattened. So Gisane's angle increases with calcaneal fractures. Um, in contrast, uh, Bowler's angle, which is the other important angle, um, and it's important to know how this is put together. So an angle subtended between the line from the highest point of the anterior process, so the highest point of the posterior facet, and a line from the highest point of the posterior facet to the highest point of the posterior tuberosity. That's the angle there. Should be about 20 to 40 degrees. And again, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, what happens when this flattens out is that angle, in this case, gets smaller, okay? So basically your calcaneus is getting flatter and flatter. So Bowler's angle gets smaller. So how do calc fractures come about? And actually someone once described it to me as trying to squash a brick. So if you squash a brick um, between your hands, so the bottom hand is your floor, the top hand is your talus, what's squeeze, 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 what's gonna happen? It's gonna blow out, okay? And that's essentially what happens. The side walls all blow out, okay? And you can see it here, the talus drives into that sinus tarsi, the angle of this gassane, and you get multiple lines going in multiple directions. And that's important for one of the classifications that we'll briefly talk about in a sec. But this is important. What I want for you guys is to sound like you know what you're talking about. And with, with calcaneal fractures, it's actually not that difficult. There's a couple of things in particular that we need to look at back to our calcaneal fracture person. The first thing is subtalar joint depression. So the talus has been driven in here and you've completely lost your posterior facet. It's all punched in. And actually, if you look really carefully, you've got all this, you've got this density here and you can see these curved lines, which are articular surface that's been punched in. To so talk about uh, posterior facet depression, subtalar joint involvement. Talk about and um, the various deformity you see. Now, this x-ray doesn't shape very well, but when it's broken, the, the tuberosity tends to go various, but also the calcaneus becomes shorter because the posterior tuberosity drives in. So you get a wide heel because you're in various, you get a short heel, and, pa and patients hate that because they struggle with footwear. They've got a really wide heel. What makes the heel even more wide is the lateral wall blowout. So like we said, when you squeeze that brick and the sides pop out, um, when that happens underneath your fibula, you get a load of problems. One, your heel becomes even more wide. Again, patients hate that struggle with footwear. But also, you get lateral wall blowout, and you suddenly get impingement underneath your fibula. So you've got stuff underneath your fibula, which causes impingement underneath the fibula, and it causes irritation to your perineal tendon. 
So if you use these phrases, you'll sound like a pro when you're talking about cal fractions. Um, there are a couple of classifications and they're not hugely useful, um, apart from in terms of helping to describe to someone over a phone, but that you'll hear them, so I wanted to go through it. The essex Presti classification is two things. It talks about primary and secondary fracture lines, and that determines what fracture pattern you get. So what happens, your talus drives down and it shears off your medial sustentaculum. So that's your primary fracture line, okay? And this bit is quite an important bit. It's constant for most calcaneal fractures, and that's why we refer to it as a constant fragment. So when you go into the more A-level stuff of calcs and you learn about how to reconstruct these, it's important to understand that we're building things back onto that. The second part of essex Lepresti, the secondary fracture line, either comes out of the top, in which case your articular surface is free to become depressed, so you get a depressed fracture, or it travels along the whole posterior body and comes out the back and you get this tongue type fracture that gets pulled up because your Achilles is pulling on top of it. Okay, so the two main fractures with the essex Lepresti are depression type or tongue type. At some point, if you haven't already, you will also come across, uh, come across this monster of a classification called the Sanders classification. Now, I used to look at these images, the one on the left in particular, and think, my God, I have no idea what's going on. It's not that complicated, and you just got to break it down a bit. Um, the first thing to say is that this is a classification for CT. Okay, so you need a CT. The second thing to say is, in particular, what you need is your widest, the widest talus on your coronal cut CT. OK, so really important. You can't make a comment about Sanders or any other view unless you've got this coronal CT. OK, and then basically it's actually not that bad. These ABC lines refer to where the fracture lines are in the count. Don't worry about those for a minute. Um, but type one fractures are as many fractures as you like, but all undisplaced. OK, so if it's undisplaced, it's a type one. If it's a type two, that means you've got two fragments. So one fracture line going up, which gives you two fragments. Unsurprisingly, type three gives you three fragments. So you've got two fracture lines and three fragments. And uh, surprise, surprise, type four gives you four separate fragments. Okay. Now, whether they're at A, a B or a C just depends where those individual lines are going. But broadly speaking, if you see a fracture with two fragments here, you can say that is a Sanders type two. Okay. If we track on a bit. So if we have a look at this, there's two fragments here, one fracture line, that's a Sanders type two. Uh, just underneath here, we've got two fracture lines, there's three fragments here, that means it must be a Sanders type three. Here, we've got three fracture lines, we've got four fragments, one, two, three, four, this must be a Sanders type four. It is actually as easy as that. So once you get an understanding about it, you can kind of get to grips with it a bit better. But it doesn't really determine what we do with our fractures, but it can be useful for descriptive purposes. So what are the treatment options? And we're going to talk a little bit about controversy here, but broadly speaking, we can either operate on them and we can manage them conservatively. Non-operative treatment involves non-weight bearing for at least a period of six to eight weeks. For me, I don't use a plaster because a plaster stops you from moving your ankle, but it also means that you've got something hard for your heel to rub against and get blisters and and um, ulcers, which is a bit of a disaster. The key here is early mobilization. Just because we're managing it without surgery doesn't mean we can't get the ankle moving and prevent ankle stiffness. We can't get your toes moving. We can't get the leg elevated to go stiff um, to help with swelling. So non-operative doesn't mean no treatment. It just means functional rehab, okay? On the surgical side, if you decide that's the way you're going, you've got to think about your approach. So traditionally, that was always an extensile lateral, but now we're moving away from that to percutaneous and sinus tarsi approaches, which are minimally invasive. You've also got to think about how you're going to fix the fracture, right? So screws, plates, or an intramedullary device. And we'll just talk a little bit about those. The extensile lateral approach is really going slash gone out of fashion. We used to do it all the time. And the reason for that is that if you put your incision far enough lateral and far enough planted, you miss all the important bits. So you miss your sural nerve, you miss your perineals, you miss the blood supply, which is the lateral calcaneal artery supplying that whole lateral wall. And you get this great um, approach where you can see everything. We used to love doing these. You get a full thickness flap that's got the blood supply still attached to it. You see the whole side of your calcaneum. You see the sub tailor joint you put a beautiful plate on everything looks lovely but then the problem with this is that you get wound complications and when they happen they can be a disaster 
And quite quickly, you go from small holes to rather large holes with metal that show. And what we now know is that you can get the same outcomes with minimally invasive techniques. OK, so these are two techniques that I use and I know other, other people are using as well, obviously. But the percutaneous technique, you make little stab incisions and you lift up the bits of bone you need to lift up. So remember, what are we trying to achieve? You want to restore your subtalar joints. So you make a little incision here and lift that up with a little periosteal. You want to get your heel out to restore some length and you want to get it out of there. So you stick a shant pin or a Steinman pin into the heel and use it as a joystick to pull your heel out and to correct the varus. Um, and you fix it with some screws to hold it all together. And that these are all done through stab incisions, which means you haven't got wound complication issues. And this patient went on to do really well. You can also do a sinus tarsi approach. You make a little incision over the sinus tarsi, um, just at the angle of Gassane, and you can slip a little plate in and you can restore your subtalar joint, get some fixation to tuberosity, and you can all do it through quite a nice little approach that heals rather well. Um, I said there's some controversies with surgical versus non-surgical, but there's one type of calcaneal fracture for, that for me is not a controversy, and that's this tongue type fracture. So as we said, the force goes all the way through the tuberosity and the, um, the Achilles pulls it up. Why is that important? Because it means that that bit of bone is pressing on the back of the skin and you can see it here and here. Um, really, it doesn't take long, uh, sorry, it doesn't take long for um, little bits of pressure areas to become skin ne necrosis. And in, in fact, some studies talk about as quickly as six hours. So for me, this is a relative surgical emergency. And they're relatively straightforward to do. You make a small incision in front of your Achilles, you make a small incision on the base of the foot, you put a clamp in there, squeeze it together, and use some big old screws to engage that plantar cortex where the good bone is and squeeze it all together. And they go on to do very well. Uh, broadly speaking, complications, it's pretty miserable having a calcaneal fracture. We've talked about wound complications. A, a fair amount of patients go on to subtalar arthritis. Um, if you've got that lateral wall blowout and you've got subfimular impingement, life is miserable. Um, the sural nerve can be injured in fracture and from surgery. They estimate that about 10% of count fractures that are nasty have a, have a compartment syndrome, which can result in pouring of the toes. Um, and mal malunion is a problem, right? So, you know, if you lose your calcaneal height, the leg feels short. <clears throat> if your heel is wide because of the lateral wall blowout and various hind foot, they hate it because you can't get into a shoe. Um, and it can be painful because of the arthritis. So pretty miserable all around. I wanted to briefly talk about evidence. Now, I know you don't have to worry about it too much at your level, but we don't know really, honestly, what's better, surgery or not. And you can find evidence to support both. So a good paper to support if you want to fix is this paper by Richard Buckley um, from Canada. And this was the American JBGS 2002. It's a multi-center a Canadian trial prospective looking at fixation versus um, conservative. And briefly speaking, if you left all the groups as they were, the two main groups, there was no difference between fixing them and non-fixing them. If you took out the workers' comp patients, which is a concept I'm sure you're aware of in America and the US and states and Canada, um, the surgical patients did much better. Okay, so this is a nice little paper to quote if you want to go around fixing calcaneal fractures. You will also be aware of the BMJ paper that had a slightly sensationalized heading, calcaneal fractures, surgery provides no benefit. And this was a prospective multi-center UK trial um, that looked at surgical versus non-surgical. And in summary, they said that there was no symptomatic or functional advantage um, at two years, whether you fix them or not, okay? And that sounds great, right? So why bother fixing any? But when you're talking about this, there were a number of non-ideals about the paper. Um, the first was the fact that there were 2,000 patients that presented with cow fractures to all those regions, of which only 502 were deemed eligible, and then only 151 agreed. So that's only 7.5% of the fracture presenting that were enrolled in the study. So I wouldn't, you know, you could argue that's not necessarily representative, okay? Um, 27 surgeons, 22 different hospitals, that's only a median of two fractures um, for the study. The infection rate was incredibly high, 19%, um, and that's significantly higher than perhaps the average of reported in the literature. Um, 
And surgeons were allowed to decide that some caps just needed fixing and those weren't included in the study and they were taken out. OK, so there are a number of issues that rise that you could say, is this as reliable as it um, sets out to be? But again, a paper that supports non-surgical intervention in some caps. So that's it. We're done. The key bits I want you to remember, these are high energy injuries, like a lot of things in the foot and ankle that are traditionally not associated with great outcomes. The main issues are tuberosity varius, calcaneus shortening, OK, both in length and in height. Subtalar joint impaction, okay, lateral wall blowout and subfibular impingement. Use those phrases and people will think that you know everything you're talking about with calf fractures. The best treatment is controversial, and the best approach, as with many things, is probably tailored, um, taking into account patient factors and fracture factors. Don't worry too much about extensile lateral because we're moving towards percutaneous and uh, more MIS techniques. And just remember, these are pretty miserable, right? Um, there's a lot of soft tissue problems, there's wound issues, they're painful and they're associated with post-traumatic arthritis. So guys, that's it. That's a whistle-stop tour. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, that's a whistle-stop tour of calc fractures. Thank you um, for coming along. Uh, it's been a bit of a marathon session. Hopefully we've covered a lot of the um, key bits. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, stick them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll pass you back over to Sharmalee.